brought to you by McGraw-Hill Education, the publishers of First Aid for the USMLE Step 1. Dr. Shane Mesko will be our speaker, presenting his talk on USMLE Step 1 Hindsights, What I Wish I Had Known Prior to the Exam. Shane is currently at MD Anderson Cancer Center, completing his residency in radiation oncology. While in medical school, Shane was elected into AOA and served on the selection committee for two and a half years, and he has almost five years of experience in evaluating med medical education curriculum, mentoring med students, and designing step one study plans. So I will soon hand over the presentation to Shane, but I will remain on the line to help answer questions that you can chat into us by writing in the little chat window in the GoToWebinar sidebar that is on your screen. And sort of, we'll play it by ear, depending on how many answers come in as Shane presents, we may wait to answer them until the end, but nonetheless, feel free to write in your questions and we'll do our best to get to them all in time. And just so you know, um, under the handouts drop down in your GoToWebinar sidebar, you can also download Shane's slides in PDF format under the handouts drop down. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to hand over the presentation to Shane now. Thank you again for your time, and we'll, uh, Shane will be taking over soon. All right, guys, uh, thanks for the introduction, Erica. Uh, we'll get started right now. Again, it's going to be uh, step one, hindsight. A uh, little bit about me just to get started. Uh, so I grew up in Southern California. I actually did my undergraduate degree at UC Irvine as well with a uh, bachelor's in neurobiology, a lot of focus on learning and memory. Did medical school at UC Irvine uh, where I did the joint MD-MBA degree. Uh, was elected to junior a AOA, like Erica mentioned, uh, did pretty well on most of the standardized exams, and I do have a lot of experience in step one mentorship. And uh, last year, completed intern year at Scripps in San Diego, and like Erica mentioned, I'll be doing uh, radiation oncology at MD Anderson for the next four years. Before we get uh, really started, just wanted to ask you guys a quick poll question, just so I can get to know you better. Uh, Erica, if we can get the poll sent out with uh, which specialties they're interested in. Um, we'll come back to this in a little bit. So if you guys can just go ahead and answer that while I kind of go through the agenda. Uh, agenda for today, we'll go over a brief history of the step one. Um, I'll talk a little bit about setting goals. Uh, then we'll go into some of the science of studying. I uh, can talk a little bit about memory, attention, mental endurance, stress reduction. And this is really going to set the framework for how we create the study plan. Uh, we'll talk about you know maximizing study time, measuring progress, kind of adapting that study plan. Um, I'll briefly touch on exam content, some resources, and then we'll finish with kind of things that surprised me. And uh, okay. the main focus, go ahead, Erica. Do, do you oh, no, I was just going to say, I, I'm sorry, I thought you were done. I was, no, it's okay. We're ready to, I can close the poll if, and we can share the results. Uh, looks like we've had most of the audience vote, so sorry to cut you off there. Nope, go ahead. Okay. Making, can can everyone see that? Hopefully. So it looks like we've got about 13% primary care, 70% into some of the other specialties, 13 into Durham Radonc Plastics, and then a few into Psych, PMR, and OB-GYN. All right, so we'll talk about uh, kind of the significance of that in just a couple slides. Can you minimize that for me, Erica? Thank you. All right, so that's the agenda. So first, let's talk a little bit about the history of the exam. So it became step one in 1992. Uh, the mean score has actually been increasing over the last eight years. It's gone from 221 to 228. Uh, what does this mean for you guys? You know, the, the 250, kind of the score that everyone tends to aim for, is becoming less impressive every year as the mean score creeps up. Uh, residencies are getting more competitive, and the charting outcomes are showing rising average scores for a lot of the competitive specialties, uh, as well as increasing number of research and extracurricular. Uh, opportunities and not only is the average score increasing but the number of questions on the test is decreasing and what this means is that each question is going to have uh, more value uh, question stems are getting longer there's an increasing influence of clinical questions and uh, less questions means that there's less less differentiation between scores so uh, you know the difference between a 255 and a 270 can kind of come down to a couple questions now um, and we'll go into a little bit more on how this changes your approach to each block a little bit later in the talk uh, I did want to briefly talk about, you know, barriers to success, why people don't do well on the exam. Just from kind of my own experience, classmates, students I've worked with, um, we'll just do one more quick poll really quick. I just want to see what your guys, uh, what you think your personal biggest barrier to success will be 
you know, when you take your step one, we can, you know, give a few seconds to answer this one. Just let me know when you're ready, Erica. Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm keeping an eye on the, it's 75% voted. I'm going to shut it off in about five seconds. All right. 86% of the results are in. So I'll share that with you guys. So pretty even spread. Uh, you know, burning out looks to be pretty common, taking on too many resources. So we can just go through each of these here. So poor planning, a lot of you picked this one. Uh, I mean, not having a solid plan is, in my opinion, one of the biggest pitfalls to step one. It usually leads to a lot of wasted time, inefficient studying, you know, even if you're actually putting the hours in. Uh, setting unrealistic expectations is another common one. You know, it's important to be ambitious but realistic, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides. Tackling a lot of resources or too many is one of the most common mistakes I see a lot of students make. You know, I think a lot of people, they browse SDN, they try to see what resources everyone else is using, and they end up, you know, overwhelmed, burned out. Um, you know, outside distractions and influences are common. Um, overworking and burning out again. We'll talk a little bit later about, you know, strategic breaks and stuff like that and how we can mitigate burnout. Um, procrastination, obviously, a big one. And then, you know, not studying what is going to be best for you, but studying what other people are doing or what other people are recommending. Um, so let's move on to some tactics to kind of get through these uh, barriers. So first, I just want to talk about, you know, setting goals. Um, before you can really make a study plan and go over a framework for answering questions and approaching the test, you should really set a goal for, you know, how you want to do. Um, and I think you guys would be surprised at how many people don't set a concrete goal. Um, I like to follow this kind of smart framework. You know, you want the goal to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and you've got to have some sort of time constriction for when you're going to achieve it. Um, so what does goal setting do for you? Well, you know, the research actually shows that it one, it increases your performance. Two, it improves your emotional well-being um, with a sense of, you know, reward and achievement. And it also gives you a framework to kind of build your study plan on. Um, and so these are kind of the questions I want you guys to think about before you, uh, you know, get to your study plan. So target goal, what is your realistic score? And I, I want to emphasize realistic. You know, everyone wants to get a 260, but if you only have three weeks of study time and you've historically been below average on tests, you know, aiming too high is really going to stress you out. It can negatively impact your performance. Uh, you know, on the flip side, if you aim too low, you may not be motivated to improve over the weeks of studying. You may not reach your potential. Um, and you really want to, you know, frame this with respect to your long-term plans, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, and you want to write down your goal test score. Um, you want to write down your test date. It makes it realistic. And again, there's got to be a time constraint, you know. Setting a goal and scheduling it is kind of universally important, but, uh, you know, you need the framework for how much time you're going to have off to study. Um, so next slide. So, you know, we've kind of talked about what I would call performance-based goals, which are, you know, I want to get a 260, I want to get into DERM residency, but the research actually shows that students who are most successful set these kind of goals called learning goals. Um, and what I mean by learning goals and what the difference is between the two, uh, learning goals are more about mastery and growth, where performance goals are more about, you know, looking intelligent, proving yourself to others, like residency directors. Um, and learning goals are things like, you know, I want to do three U-world blocks every other day, or I want to watch two hours of Pathoma today. Um, and, you know, if you go into each day saying that you want to get a 260, uh, you know, that's not really a definitive goal for the day, and you're going to find yourself kind of wandering around with that kind of goal. So just to bring it all home with an example, um, Erica, can we pull up one last poll just to see what your guys' target scores are, and then we'll kind of go through this. Absolutely. Okay, great. I got 80, now 90% have voted. I'm going to go ahead and close this and share the results. Perfect. So good. So it looks like, you know, the most common range, we've got a lot of people aiming for that 260 plus, and we've got, you know, a decent amount of people in that 240 to 249 range, which I think is very reasonable. And uh, so when... You look at this, uh, you know, this chart on the left here. Um, what it kind of shows you is that there's a, this is the NMRP data, so directly from the, you know, the people that put on the step one. Um, so, you know, just starting with the primary care folks. Um, so you guys that are interested in primary care, we can see the median scores for matched applicants kind of ranges in the 220 to 230 range. 
And if you contrast this with, you know, the Derm Plastics Ortho group, um, you know, median scores are going to be over 250. And so the importance is that, you know, these two groups are going to have different goals and expectations when it comes to step one. You know, if you have no geographical preference, you're doing primary care, you may not need to spend, you know, two months grinding away block after block trying to get a 270. Um, on the flip side, you know, if you're going into plastic surgery, you want to be in the LA area or another competitive market, you're going to need a high score, you know, just to have a decent chance of getting an interview there. Um, and that's not to say you can't match plastics or derm with a 220 um, or that you shouldn't try hard if you're going into primary care, but there's an important trend there. And like I said, I want you to get to kind of set the goal based on that. Um, and remember, again, median scores are continuing to rise every year. A lot more programs are screening applicants out on scores alone. Um, and, you know, here's just a quick kind of example on the right side of how you would set your goal. You, you got your baseline score, your goal score, how many days you're going to have to study. And uh, we'll go a little bit more into the specific, you know, daily goals on the next few slides. All right. So now you've kind of got a goal. Um, you need to create a study plan on how to get there. But before we do that, I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about, you know, the science of actually studying. Um, I'm sure you guys know the basics, you know, study in the right environment, quiet room, good lighting. I want to talk about just some proven study techniques to improve your attention span, memory, decrease stress, improve your mental prep. Um, I'm sure you guys all know someone who seems to never study hard or is a naturally good test taker. And you actually notice that those people kind of employ a lot of these techniques without ever having been specifically trained to do so. Um, so first, you know, distractions. Distractions are your biggest enemy when studying. I think this is obvious. We all deal with it every day. Um, I bet a, you know, a good portion of you guys are currently multitasking while listening to this, you know, checking Facebook, browsing Instagram. Um, but how can you kind of mitigate that during your step one, and uh, why is that important? So in order to kind of illustrate that, I just want to go through, you know, a quick example, um, and then we can kind of get into the specifics. So let's take, you know, student one as our first example. Student one kind of decides, you know, I'll wake up around 9 a.m., I'll do some U-World and some first aid. You know, it sounds like a pretty decent plan. Uh, what ends up ap happening in reality to student one? Uh, I'm sure we've all been student one, you know, occasionally, but uh, you end up, you know, snoozing a few times, waking up groggy around 1030, you browse Instagram in bed for a little bit, you know, you get up and start that first U-World block and you're about 15 questions in, your phone buzzes and it's your buddy sending you a YouTube video and you end up on YouTube for a little while. You know, you start U World again, but then you're hungry. You go take a lunch break. You decide to watch, you know, an episode of Game of Thrones while at lunch. And you know, next thing you know, it's eight o'clock. You're panicking. You're on SDN, and you end up, you know, reading first aid until 3 a.m. And you kind of decide you'll do something different tomorrow. And you don't want to get caught in that kind of habit. Um, it's really not efficient. And we'll contrast that with student two. So student two planned his schedule out in, in advance. He's got learning goals on there. You know, he wakes up at nine, well rested, has breakfast, gets ready to work while his mind's fresh. He takes scheduled breaks, he eats lunch, you know, he gets a little exercise in, gets to sleep at a decent hour after, you know, a solid nine to ten hours of studying. And, uh, you know, I want to emphasize that, you know, this schedule may not be realistic to everyone. If you're a slower, faster reader, you know, you may not get through four blocks in, you know, two hours or whatever. But, um, you know, it's important to kind of really schedule out that study day. Uh, and that's going to allow you, you know, to not kind of aimlessly do things when you've got a, a definitive plan. So moving on, uh, you know, you saw how planning your day can really help with the structure. I just wanted to kind of break it down. Um, you'll notice I had a lot of breaks built into that sample uh, schedule. And uh, the research really shows that that's important. You can kind of think of your brain as a muscle. You know, what happens when you use a muscle over and over? It gets tired, it gets sore, it needs a rest. And your brain really needs rest too. Um, there was a recent study from this company called Desk Time. They're kind of a work time tracking company. They looked at five and a half million records per day through their tracking software, and they specifically kind of grabbed the top 10% most productive workers. And they define most productive as doing the most work in the shortest period of time. And uh, what they found is that the sweet spot for uh, dedicated work was 52 minutes of working, followed by a complete rest period for 17 minutes. Um, and, you know, it's going to be different depending on what study you look at, and this is just one little bit of research. Obviously, the exact amount of time is going to be different for, you know, depending on what task you're working on and person by person. But the point is, you know, what I want to emphasize, you want to give 100% of your attention when you're working and then 0% when you're on a break. And this is going to allow you to be most productive while you're working, and you'll find that you're much more productive in general and more efficient. Uh, this next point, you know, may be a little bit more controversial. Um, besides taking breaks during the day, my other recommendation was to take, you know, a big break somewhere midway through your dedicated study time. And, you know, what I think this does for you is it gives you a really, like, a mental reset. It helps you refocus. You look at the bigger picture. You avoid burnout. Uh, I personally 
took three days off with no studying about halfway through, and I, I'd recommend taking you know anywhere between one and three days and just not studying at all. Relax, catch up with friends, take a trip somewhere. Um, and the big reason for this is you want to avoid this state of mind called cognitive boredom, where you actually really can impair new memory formation and lose attention due to overstudying the same topics, the same areas. And uh, obviously, if you only have two weeks of dedicated study time, it's going to be much different than if you have two months off. Um, I'd recommend you know that everyone build in at least a day or two off somewhere in there just to kind of refocus and uh, freshen up your state of mind. So sleep, uh, you know, you got your breaks down. Sleep's going to be important too. It obviously becomes more and more difficult to come by as you get further in your medical training. Uh, intern year, you guys will see it's much worse. Um, but during step one studying time, it's really one of the only times that you have complete control of your schedule for the most part. Um, and there's an overwhelming body of research that shows that lack of sleep impairs your ability to focus, prohibits long-term memory formation, you increase your cortisol production and stress. I would personally recommend, you know, trying to get at least seven hours of sleep a night. And if you can get on a schedule, it'll make it much better. Um, and just, you know, kind of a side point. Everyone says that you need to get a good night's sleep the night before the test, but like to be honest, I don't think anyone can really sleep the night before the test. I'd recommend trying to get a good night's sleep two nights before the test just to kind of bank that sleep and to uh, really be safe. Uh, next, you know, just extra activities. You know, you're sleeping while you're taking breaks. You got to have balance during dedicated study time. Um, if you try and work 18 hours a day, even if you're taking breaks, you're going to burn out. Um, another thing that a lot of people ask is like, should I work on research during my step one? Should I do anything else academic? I would recommend staying away from that. You know, you only have a certain amount of mental bandwidth. Um, and if you're doing that stuff, it's ultimately going to be a distraction. Uh, so specific strategies. So, you know, I've talked about taking breaks, sleeping, exercising. You guys are probably wondering when I'm going to talk about actual studying. Um, so we can get started with some specific study strategies. So first one that I think is really important is interval studying. Um, basically, this, the theory says that if you space out studying of topics over time, your recall is going to be better. You can see the graph on the right. Uh, you know, if someone just looks at something once, you're only going to remember it 5 to 10% of the time. If you repeat it in kind of a cramming fashion uh, over a short period of time, it's still only about a 30% recall rate. And then if you look at the far right bar, you know, if you study something multiple times over a longer time period, the recall is upward of 80%. And that's what you want to do for step one. So think of it this way. If you cram biochem for a week, and then you cram anatomy, and then you cram microbiome, by the time it's your test day, you may not have seen biochem in several weeks. Um, so my approach was to really study integrated materials. So I would do cardiopath, then cardiopharm, then you know cardioanatomy. Um, then I'd start reading a little bit of neuro, and I would space out my cardiocubane questions over the next few days while I started reading neuro, mixing in some of those questions. And that way, I was always kind of spreading out topics over longer periods of time. And it allows you to kind of reinforce and integrate them with other topics. You really want to see the material in as many ways as possible and as many times over your dedicated study period. And the research, again, shows that your retention is going to be much, much higher if you do that. If you want to kind of amplify that effect even more, if you plan out what resources you're going to use for step one way in advance, so during first and second year, you use the same resources for your classes and shelf exams that you're going to use for your dedicated study time, then all those resources are going to be familiar, and then that repeated studying, that interval is going to be even stronger. Uh, the next one, kind of obvious, but active versus passive studying. What do I mean by that? You know, anyone can read through first aid five times, um, but the studies, they really show that simply reading doesn't reinforce knowledge. It can actually give you the sense of familiarity that really breeds overconfidence. Um, the same research shows that doing practice tests and questions integrated with the reading improves the memory, decreases stress. Uh, so the takeaway from that point is, you know, do questions every day, don't put them off, and don't just read. Uh, try and engage in the material. Next would be, you know, varying the topics and the types of resources. So this is, again, important to avoid losing attention. If all you do is read books, you're going to get bored of re reading and your brain's going to lose focus. You know, watch some pethoma, watch some sketchy micro after reading for a few hours. Mix up topics. Um, it's just kind of important to kind of plan your schedule like that so you're not just doing one thing. Um, and the last few things, I thought this really worked well. When you don't understand something, write it out. Um, again, it's a different form of studying. Um, it can really you know, take a little bit extra time, but it works for the weaker sections. Um, and something I did was to keep a list of really tough concepts uh, that I found incredibly helpful. So basically, anytime I got a question wrong or I wasn't sure or there was an answer choice that I didn't quite understand, I would write a one-liner of what that topic was. Um, and I have just some examples. This is literally off my the sheet that I made, so just some one-liners. And by the end of my dedicated study time, I had 26 pages of these one-liners. 
and I used this as my last minute study prep for the days before the test and it was a great review of you know all the tough questions I'd come across over the past few weeks you know when you paraphrase it into one line it kind of reinforced it that way and I think that when you get down these small details that aren't in a lot of the review sources that's really what takes you from kind of the, the 250 to the 260 range all right, so designing the actual plan, probably one of the most important parts of the step one process, other than maybe building the foundation during the first two years of school. But at this point, you know, you've set a goal, you, you understand how to study, now how are you going to get uh, you know, to that goal score? I think so many students go into step one without a solid plan. You know, they just read at first aid, they do you world questions, and, you know, it's suddenly it's a week before their scheduled test date, and they realize they should have done this resource, they're nowhere near where they wanted to be. Um, so, you know, what makes a good plan? So it needs a few elements. One, it's got to be comprehensive enough to get you to your target score, but not so comprehensive that it's completely impossible. Um, two, it's got to be balanced with respect to breaks, resources, mediums of studying. You know, it should be realistic. So you don't want your plan to have seven Q banks and 100 pages of reading a day for two months because it's not going to be realistic. Um, it should address your specific weaknesses. You know, a bad study plan is one that's unfocused. It just kind of covers all the topics broadly because someone told you to do that or because your friend did that. You know, if you're a pharmacist in med school, you probably don't need to review farm as much as someone who doesn't have a good knowledge base on that. Um, a good plan also measures progress. You know, you need to know how you're doing and adjust from there. And then last, you know, a good plan should be made for you. It shouldn't be something that's broad. Um, it should, you know, no two plans are going to be the same, just like no two students are the same. You're going to have different goals, different weaknesses. So make the plan that really works for you. So let's go into some specifics. Um, so obviously, you know, you want to build your foundation early. Um, that's going to be one of the biggest things. Um, you know, you've already set your goal. You're going to want to take uh, a practice test. So I, I advise taking an NBME practice test on day one. Um, you know, you want to take the score with a grain of salt because there's a lot of variation in the practice test. but it should give you an idea throughout your studying, you know, plus or minus 10 points on where you currently stand. So if you get a 190 on your first practice test and you want a 255 on the real deal, you know, you've got a long way to go where, you know, if someone gets a 270 on their first practice test and they only have three weeks of studying, then they're in pretty good shape. Uh, picking your resources, you know, again, you got to be honest with yourself. Where are your weaknesses? Where do you want to spend time early on? Um, and this is kind of going to gauge how much time you spend on each resource, resource per day. Uh, then you're going to start filling out your schedule. I'll show you guys an example in just a second. But again, you want to be realistic with your plan. Don't be too aggressive, but don't be, you know, too easy on yourself. You're not going to reach your potential. Uh, you want to map out your sample days. So we already went through that example. You know, if you're unfocused, you don't have your day planned out, you're kind of going to be wandering aimlessly around. Um, this next point, so I really would recommend taking as many of the NBME practice tests as you guys can afford. They cost like $50 each. Um, the answers aren't officially available, but um, I would recommend going through every single answer you got wrong or you weren't sure about. Um, I'd plan on spending about five to six hours total taking and reviewing each test. Uh, what I did is I would Google the question stem, and you can usually find the answers online. Um, these tests are great for a number of reasons. One, they monitor your progress. They tell you where you're at. Um, you can get the added score report, which I'd recommend. Two, they expose you to... Uh, old USMLE questions, and you know, in a lot of cases, there were questions on my test that were literally it, identical to questions that came from the MBME. Um, and then last, they really mentally prepare you since they're three or four hours long, and you can use the score guides to kind of guide your progress. Um, you know, I remember scoring 255 on one and then dropping to a 230 the next week, so don't sweat it if you know you don't do well on one. Um, and then last, you just want to adjust your plan based on performance and weaknesses. Um, again, that's important. You know, if you're doing really well on one subject, kind of go a little lighter on studying that. If you keep doing terribly in, you know, renal pathology, then focus on renal pathology for a few days. This is just, hey Shane, you know, can I, um, yeah. sorry to interrupt, can I just jump in? I have a, a question came in that was relevant to the last slide um, from yeah. Shannon, and she asked, how do you feel about using a step one tutor during MS2 and or dedicated step study period? Do you know students who have done this and been successful? So, um, I don't know if you want to speak to that really quick. Sure, yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of step one tutoring services, and I think that they can be uh, very useful, uh, you know, in kind of helping you come up with this plan and kind of deciding how you're going to approach things. Uh, that said, you know, I don't think it's necessary. I think that if you're the kind of person who kind of needs someone to kind of be on your back and measuring your progress for you as you go along, they can be really useful. Um, but if you really sit down and you're honest with yourself and you make your own plan and you kind of know how you want to approach your time off, then I think that you'd be okay. 
what a lot of other people do is they'll have, you know, before their dedicated time, they'll have some group sessions with some friends to kind of go over and bounce ideas off each other in terms of what their plan is going to be, and that can kind of fill that same role. Um, but during the actual dedicated time, I think it's easiest to work on your own, but again, everyone's going to be different. Great, thank you. Hopefully that answered the uh, question. Um, so just this is just a quick example of a schedule. You know, you can make it as detailed or not detailed as you want. As you can see here, this person kind of has each day planned out with what they want to do. There's some time off scheduled in there. Um, you know, they've got how many blocks they want to accomplish. Some people will even include how many pages of a book they want to read or what their specific book is. But the point is, you just want to make a, a schedule and stick to it. Um, so measuring progress, this is probably one of the uh, most important things. Um, Again, I want to emphasize doing practice tests is going to be one of the most important things. Um, you know, this is just an example of one of the score reports that come with them. I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen these. If not, you probably will see them. Um, you know, if you look at this, you say, okay, you're doing great in a lot of subjects. You could be better in behavioral sciences. You could be better in reproductive and endocrine, maybe a little better in GI. And this is where you can kind of tailor um, your focus of your studying. Um, Another thing, you know, you can kind of just track. This isn't my progress. This is just something I found online. But you can kind of track your progress as you go. Um, that can kind of keep you with your goal score framed. Um, you know, it's important. The more you do these, the more tests you take, the more accurately you'll be able to predict your final score um, and kind of cater your plan. You know, two weeks into my studying, I realized that my study schedule was too aggressive and I had to change things up a little bit. It really wasn't realistic. I also pushed my test back one week. Um, in retrospect, I probably wouldn't have done that. My practice scores have been the same for, you know, three weeks before that, and I think a lot of people push their tests back, end up just being a little bit more burned out. So exam content and resources is always uh, something people ask. You know, I'll be real brief here because it's going to depend on what you're uh, most familiar with and where you're coming from, but um, I do have some advice on how to approach the actual exam. You know, the new step one has dropped the number of questions per block. Um, like we talked about initially, um, generally the questions are a little bit longer, require more steps. So seven sections, 40 questions each, uh, an hour per block. You've got 90 seconds per question. How are you going to approach those questions? Um, so my strategy was to make two full passes on the test. Um, and I'm a pretty quick reader, so that was doable. It may not be doable for some people. Um, but here's kind of how I approached that uh, strategy. So step one, you know, I like to read the last line or the last few lines and quickly scan the answers. And why is that important? So you, you'll see a lot of t uh, questions like this one on the right where it's this long or multi-paragraph question. It's got labs to go through. You know, maybe there's a picture involved. And the actual question is a simple statement where you didn't even need to read the whole thing. So looking at this question, you know, if you were just reading through questions kind of in the traditional way, you'd be like, okay, a 62-year-old woman comes in, blah, blah, blah. She has these findings on x-ray. You know, you could spend 30 to 60 seconds reading that. If you just look at the last sentence, it's just asking you what the mechanism is, and it's telling you what the drug is in the sentence before that. So you don't even need to read the question, um, and that can save you time, you know, uh, for other tougher questions. The other benefit to that is that, you know, let's say it wasn't a simple question like this. It still tells you what to look for when you go back through the question. So if it's like, what is the diagnosis? You know, you're going to be looking at it from that state of mind. What is the causal organism or what is the medication? It changes the way you're going to, you know, look for the question. You can kind of start formulating answers in your head before you finish the questions. And this is going to allow you to move through questions quicker. Um, so let's say, you know, that, that that strategy didn't get you the answer. So then you're going to want to read the rest of the STEM. Um, you know, you should already know what they're looking for. You should know what the possible answer choices are. So now you're really looking for things that are going to push you one way or, the, or another. Um, you want to read quickly here. Ideally, my strategy was that I was either going to know the answer to the question or I was going to need to spend more time on it later. I would kind of make that decision within like 30 to 60 seconds. Um, and if I couldn't pick quickly, then I would move to the next question. Uh, again, you want to highlight important things. You should be formulating the answer. And you really want to look for patterns, too. Um, you know, these patterns, year after year, they're the same. You know, if it's a 30 to 40-year-old African-American female, it's almost always sarcoidosis. If it's a female athlete, they're always pointing towards something related to anorexia. Um, so make sure you get those patterns down. And then when you come to pick an answer, you know, you can usually rule out several choices, and you're usually stuck between, you know, two or three. Go with the one that's most supported by the STEM. You know, if, if there's a fact that isn't supported, like, uh, you know, the patient has a rash, but uh, the disease that you're looking at for an answer choice doesn't have a rash, then, you know, try to avoid those ones. Don't pick that answer. Um, and, you know, for me, I usually answered about 60 to 70% of questions on the first pass. There were some blocks where I was only at about 50%. I completed the first pass through all the questions in about 30 to 40 minutes usually. 
that gave me 20 to 30 minutes for a second pass. Again, it's going to vary based on your reading speed. Um, I really skipped questions that were longer or required a lot of analysis, like certain stats questions. You know, if you're strapped for time, think about it this way. It's better to spend three minutes on three questions than to spend three minutes on one long question and then have to rush through the rest of the test. Um, it's really important that you practice whatever technique. So if you're going to do this on the actual test, practice it when you do your U world blocks um, because you don't want to change it up on the day of the test. Uh, so then, you know, the second pass I would do uh, would be kind of this strategy. I would go through every question again. Um, and, you know, so some questions, if I wasn't confident for my first pass, or if I was confident for my first pass, I would immediately move on to the next one. I would spend, you know, five seconds looking at If I had any doubt, I would quickly skim that question again uh, and then move on. Sometimes I would change it, you know, if I had made an obvious mistake. Um, questions that I had absolutely no idea on, you guys are going to come across these. I would usually mark with a flag and then skip it um, if it wasn't something I could figure out quickly. Those are going to be the ones that you're going to come back on later. Um, the main focus of my second pass was to really answer questions that I had narrowed down to two or three answers and then spend time working through these ones. Um, and at the end of my second pass, there were usually about four to seven marked questions left and I had about five to ten minutes left. And I would spend these last five to ten minutes just kind of working through these tough, tough questions. Um, and you know, a lot of you, well, why do you do so many passes? Why not just do one and go slow? Um, my thoughts on this are that you can quickly answer all the easy questions that you feel most prepared for and kind of lock in a base score. And let's say that that base score is a 230. Then you can kind of revisit questions that were tougher, that were split between two answers. You know, sometimes there's a later question in the block that gives you a hint towards an earlier question. Or maybe, you know, the 10 to 20 minutes since you saw that question allowed something to click in your brain. Um, or maybe it's just a longer stem and you missed a key fact. And I think that getting those type of questions right brings you up to, you know, a 240, 250. And then last, you have the really tough questions. They're obscure diseases or mechanisms you've never heard of or never studied. Um, and if you can make a good educated guess on these, I think that that's what gets you into the 260 range. And, uh, you know, that being said, this isn't the only strategy to approach it. Um, it worked for me. It may not work for you. Some people like to do just one careful, slow pass and, you know, mark a few questions and come back on. And I encourage you to try both of them during your dedicated time and pick the one that works best for you. Uh, exam content itself, you know, look at the USMLE website. It's got the breakdown. You'll know what's going to be on your test. Uh, a lot of people don't even look at this. Um, again, I had a lot of questions from the practice tests that were repeated verbatim on the actual test. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that on the test, you're going to come across a lot of questions that are repeated across blocks. Um, so if you come across something you don't know the answer to, like say it's one of those really hard questions, um, you know, on your next break, feel free to take your phone out or open first aid or whatever and look up that question because there were so many times, you know, that I had something that I didn't know the answer to. I looked it up on my phone on a break and that same topic came up on a later block. And, you know, you can get a couple extra points, you know, getting those questions right later. Um, so there's something you can do, but I wouldn't stress over it too much. Uh, you know, next let's talk about just resources. Um, Cram Fighter actually has a pretty cool page. I'll show you guys real quick. Um, here where they're showing you the most popular resources that people use. You know, this isn't necessarily the best resources. It's just that they can see everything that people are putting into their study plans. And this is the percent of students using each one. So if you guys ever need, you know, ideas or you want to know what everyone else is using, this is kind of a, a cool page for that. Um, just going back over here to the slideshow. So resources, there's a ton of resources available. Don't try and focus on too many of them. You're going to spread yourself too thin. Um, you know, you'll focus more on getting through books than actually learning the material if you do that. You don't want to do that. Um, again, no one can read them all. You want to use what works for you. Everyone has a list of resources they recommend. You know, I used to send my list of resources I recommended, but you really want to decide on what you're going to use early on. Figure out where your weaknesses are. Again, don't pick too many resources. You know, you don't need to use Kaplan Micro and Sketchy Micro at the same time. Um, you know, you can spend hours a day on SDN looking at what other people are using buying new books, but if you spent that time that you use analyzing books to just study, uh, you'd probably end up doing better. Um, and again, you know, kind of separate books that you use into two different categories. The ones you use during your classes and in your shelves over the first two years, and then the ones used for your dedicated time. Like I said earlier, if you can get those to overlap, it's going to make it much easier because you're going to be familiar with the questions or familiar with the resources and the material. So if you used, you know, Sketchy Farm for your farm classes, use that again for your dedicated time. Don't switch to something else because uh, that familiar, familiarity will really help you. Uh, just last, just wanted to talk about, you know, a couple things that kind of surprised me with the test. 
um, you know, first, it is very mentally exhausting, uh, not only the studying, but the test itself. You know, you just kind of come out at the end of the day wondering what just happened. Um, so be prepared, you know, be mentally focused. Um, the other thing that was tough for me personally was, you know, questions that I didn't know the answer to. It was hard to kind of get those out of my mind afterwards. Um, you keep thinking about them. So try and get those out of your mind. Try not to focus on the ones you got wrong. Try and, you know, come into each block fresh and ready to go. Everyone thinks they did terrible right after this exam. You know, you'll do well if you prep well. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. You know, everyone thinks that they bombed the test and then the scores come back. And most people did about what they expected. So diminishing returns of studying, again, you know, you can only study so much. If you study for two months and your scores have been consistent, you know, postponing your test like I did, taking another week, is going to get you maybe, you know, a couple more questions, right? It's not going to have much return. Um, and it's just going to make you more burned out for the actual test. And then last, you know, step one seems like a huge deal right now. You know, once you start residency, no one cares about step one anymore. I'm sure you guys have heard this before. You're going to be a doctor in whatever specialty you end up in. Whether you're in that specialty with a 270 or a 220, no one knows. Your co-residents don't know. Your attendings will never ask you about it. Um, so try not to stress about it once you get your score. Uh, you know, it is what it is, and you'll end up where you end up. Um, so those are things that surprised me. Um, just in summary, you know, important things, you know, setting realistic defined goals. You want to study smarter, take your breaks, you know, get good sleep. Uh, you know, focus on, you know, employing actual strategies to attack the questions. Don't just kind of aimlessly study. Make a real, realistic, detailed, and a specific plan so you don't end up like student one from that example we went over. Again, you want to measure your progress and adjust it. If you're not near your target score, you may want to add some more time or change up your resources. And then, you know, do well on the test and don't look back. That's all I got for you guys. Uh, hopefully that was informative, and uh, I guess we can go into some questions now. Yeah, thanks, Shane. Um, I have two questions for you um, that I've seen pop in. The first one is from Suman, and it's, I want to score above 260 plus. How to improve from 240 to 260? Sure. So, you know, I think that's a common question. I think a lot of it is going to depend, one, on how much time you have. You know, if you've got months and months to study and you can review everything in detail, then uh, you know, you're going to be in a much better place. If you've got a short amount of time, then I think you've really got to emphasize on working on the reasons why are you at a 240. Are you at a 240 because you're really weak in one subject? Are you at a 240 because you're weak in everything? Um, and again, I think what I kind of alluded to is what separates the 240, 250 range from the 260, 270 range is one, a lot of those little details. And two, if you can't get all those little details, is just test taking strategy. How to approach the questions so that you can get questions right that you don't necessarily know the answer to, uh, making an educated guess. So I think, you know, really focusing on test taking strategy and then, you know, coming up with a plan depending on how much time you have off is what's going to take you from, you know, 240, 250 up into the 260 range. Great. Um, I just saw another question come in from Meredith. I'm going to save Cameron's question because it's about cram fighter, so I'll answer that one. But um, Meredith asked, do you have any strategies for studying alongside MS2 classes? Sure. So during MS2 classes, I would recommend, you know, picking out what resource you're going to use for step one and using that resource during your MS2 classes. You know, it's tough at a lot of schools that have, uh, you know, class-specific exams that are not board relevant or are based on lecture material. Um, that makes it a little tougher, but I think, you know, doing UWorld questions early, um, you know, working on your resource that you're going to use for step one while you're in classes, it's just going to make it so when you do come to your dedicated study time, you're so familiar with those resources. And I think that that familiarity is really what helps you be more efficient and kind of get through stuff quicker. Okay, great. Hopefully that answered the question. And then finally, I'll address Cameron's question. Um, are resources such as Cram Fighter reliable for preparing a decent study schedule, or do they reduce flexibility? So I, I could take a pass at answering that. Um, just to make sure I understand the question correctly. So Cramfighter actually does allow you to customize your own personal study schedule quite a bit. Um, you can do things like telling it how many hours you want to spend on the types of resources that you've chosen, like, oh, I want to spend four hours a day on books. I want to spend two hours a day on QBanks. Um, those kind of things. You can input your um, known days off or days that you're taking practice exams. Um, so it can kind of build you a study schedule with those days kind of blacked out on your schedule. Um, and then also, as you go through, if you're, you know, kind of barreling through and using your daily study plan and getting through all your tasks, but then something happens, it's life, right? You fall behind for whatever reason, and you're like, oh my god, I'm going to have to throw this well-crafted study plan out the window. 
we don't actually, that's not the case with Cram Fighter. You can actually easily rebalance your schedule so that you can push out those uh, overdue study tasks to future days and still keep yourself on track to get through all the resources that you need to in time for your exam. So hopefully that, um, hopefully that answers your question, Cameron. Let me know if I could answer any follow-up questions. Um, and I actually just saw one more come in from Darcy. I only have one month of dedicated time in March after my second year ends. I was just wondering how I can make the most of this time when it's not really a ton of time to prepare. Yeah, so that's a great question. I think, you know, a lot of people face short, you know, as low as two weeks to one month of study time. And I think where you can do best in that is to kind of start almost a quasi-dedicated study time before you actually get to your dedicated. And by that, I mean, you know, start UWorld questions early. You know, I started UWorld in December, and I had classes until March as well. Um, and, you know, I think you can kind of help yourself in class that way also, because you can, if you're doing pathology and you're focusing on, you know, pathology of the lungs, you can do some UWorld questions that focus on that. Um, so you can actually kind of start getting through things earlier. You can read the first aid sections that coordinate to your class. Um, that way, you know, it's not really just four weeks to study. It's really four weeks to continue studying. Um, and again, I would still take a, a practice test at the beginning of the uh, dedicated just to see where you stand. And that'll tell you, you know, where you're at and how intense you need that four weeks to be. Okay. And Keeping an eye on the question pane here, I haven't seen any other, oh, Suman just came in with another one. <laughs> what resources and QBanks did you use, and what, according to you, helped acing the exam with such great scores? So what I use, and, you know, things have changed. I took step one three to four years ago, or however many years it's been now. Uh, I mean, I use UWorld for my QBank, and, you know, there's a lot of different opinions on this. You know, you're going to hear people who say, save UWorld for your dedicated study time. And uh, I kind of don't believe in that uh, approach. I think that UWorld serves multiple functions. One, it helps you measure like where you're at, what you're weak in, and it gets you kind of that mental endurance. Two, I think if you know every fact in UWorld and you know first aid, if you use nothing else, I think you can get a 250, just knowing those things and being a decent test taker. So with that in mind, I made you know two full passes on UWorld. One, from kind of December to March going along with class and then another one during my dedicated study time. And then a third kind of half pass on just questions that I had wrong on UWorld still. Um, so I didn't feel the need to use any other QBanks. I thought that all the QBanks are generally going to have enough information and just getting through one and knowing almost everything in it was important. In terms of actual resources, I mean, everyone's going to use first aid. And then I think the resources you use to supplement those two things are going to be based on where you're weak how much time you have and how quick of a studier you are. Um, so I think I'm a pretty quick reader, so I was able to get through a lot of resources. Um, and I used, again, the same things that I used during the year. So I like reread Golian Path. I used, uh, you know, Clinical Micro Made Ridiculously Simple, which is essentially a print version of what Sketchy Micro is now. Um, so, you know, I was really weak in neuroanatomy, so I bought like a little neuroanatomy text and read through that. Um, but, you know, I think that you can get a decent score, again, knowing you world in first aid really well, and anything else is just working on your weaknesses and kind of preparing more depending on what time you have. Great, thank you. Guys, These keep the questions coming. I have two more for you, um, Shane. Let's see. We have, um, for those from Cameron, for, for those of us planning to take the USMLE and Comlex, do you have any recommendations for balancing prep or how much time to leave between exams to avoid burnout? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, you know, again, it depends on how much time you have to get those two tests done. Um, you know, some one train of thought is to take them close to each other. You know, I wouldn't do them closer than a couple days at most, maybe out to a week, just because, you know, spending eight, nine hours taking one test is mentally exhausting. But, you know, the advantage of doing them together is that you take one and then you can kind of focus on whatever the small differences are in that week off and then take the other one while you're still in that frame of mind. Um, whereas if you take a long gap between the two, you know, that's a, a longer period to be studying for, maybe a little bit more burned out for whichever one you plan to take second. Um, you know, again, I guess it depends on your confidence level. Um, personally, if I was doing it, I would probably do them a week to two weeks apart. And, uh, you know, whichever one's more important to you is the one I would do first if you feel prepared. If you don't feel prepared, then I would do the other one first and then spend those extra two weeks, you know, putting in the work for the second one. Um, but again, I think it really depends on how much time you have. Okay. 
Um, hopefully that answered the question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Then from Simonette, which practice tests gave you a score that was closest to your actual exam score? Would you recommend we use those last? So if you look at you know Student Doctor Network or some of the forums, there's all these people recommend the order to take the practice tests in. Um, you know, some are, people will say like this one was much harder, this one was much easier. Um, you know, I don't think that there really is a specific order that you need to take them in. Um, I think that if you once you've taken five, six, seven of the tests, you have a general idea of what your score is going to be around. Uh, a lot of people save the UWorld subject exams. There's two of them um, for the end, just because it kind of uh, wraps things up. You know, in the end, the UWorld ones were closest to my score. Um, the, my actual score was like 10 points higher than I got on any of the NBMEs. And I think a lot of that is, you know, when you're in the actual test environment, you're more focused, you know it's real. Um, you know, you spend more time answering the questions and don't kind of take them for granted. Um, so I think that you definitely can do better than your practice tests. Um, but it's hard to say which one correlates best. And again, you're taking them over, a, you know, up to a two-month period. So the practice tests that you took two weeks in may be a better predictor of your score or the test itself was a better predictor of the USMLE, but you still had six more weeks of studying to do after that. So hard to say, but I think you can get a general idea. Okay, great. Um, another question from Darcy. Would you recommend doing UWorld blocks based on subject slash system or doing random blocks? So that's a great question, and uh, that kind of plays into it. I went through UWorld twice. The first time going through it, I did it by subjects and systems, and that was based on whatever I was studying in class or for shelf at the same time. Um, and the reason I did it that way is, you know, if you read a block on uh, cardiophysiology and then you do a UWorld block on cardiophysiology, it really drills down that information. Um, and then, you know, the second time through, it was completely random, and I feel like that's where you kind of figure out what you know, what you don't know, and you learn, and you get used to the mental prep. So I think it really depends on, you know, where you're approaching it from. The problem with doing uh, just subject blocks of UWorld is that a lot of the questions are very similar. So you'll get questions right just because you saw a question similar to it, you know, five questions ago. Um, so I think that's good for learning, but not good for testing yourself. Okay, great. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, any more questions or follow-up comments, anything like that? We have a couple more minutes until the top of the next hour, which is when we're due to stop. Um, I haven't seen any more questions come in, so I guess we can uh, probably go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you, Shane. That was great. Awesome content. Hopefully everyone attending found it really helpful. We appreciate your time, and I appreciate all the attendees' uh, time who joined up with us today. Um, as I mentioned, this webinar is it was recorded, so and I will send a follow-up email with a link to the recording so you can view it. Um, I guess if there's any follow-up questions, I don't know if Shane is necessarily going to be available to answer them, but if I can answer questions about Cram Fighter, um, I'm happy to. My email address is erica at cramfighter.com. Oh, one more question just came in. <laughs> Simonette, do you recommend using UWorld on tutored mode? So I think that's fine to use UWorld on tutor mode um, during your when you're not taking you know timed blocks. Um, again, depending on what purpose you're using it for, uh, I only use it for time blocks during my dedicated when I was doing random samples. Uh, most of the other time, you know, I like the tutor mode. I like to do the question and immediately get the feedback. Um, to me, you know, when I'm studying to learn, it's easier to see it and then immediately read what I did wrong than to see it and then read what I did wrong after an hour of doing other questions. Um, so, you know, I think there is definitely a value in using it in that mode depending on where you're at in your studying. All right. Um, I guess any other questions? Otherwise, we can kind of wind things down. As I mentioned, I will send out a... Uh, email with a link to the recording of this webinar, and there's a lot of juicy content in here. I'm sure you'll want to um, re-watch, go through again. Um, so again, Shane, thank you so much for your time and for, for sharing your knowledge and experience with, with the audience here. Um, thanks to everyone who attended. Um, and <laughs> Osuman said, thank you. It has been really helpful and reinforcing. It's 4 a.m. in the morning here in India. You made it worth it. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so glad thank to you. hear that. Really, really glad to hear that. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. I don't I don't know if there's any other questions. As I mentioned, my email address is Erica E R I C A at cramfighter.com. 
I'm happy to try to answer any additional follow-up questions about um, Cram Fighter itself. I don't, as I said, I don't know if Shane's going to have time necessarily to do follow-up questions via email, but um, you know, if if something is utterly burning and you have to know, um, we'll see what we can do. Um, otherwise, I think uh, we're good. We'll we'll wind things up. And again, thanks to everyone for attending, and thanks to Shane for the presentation. So thanks a lot. Bye.